I was uh, visiting with a, uh, a church member uh, recently who was describing certain changes in the worship services taking place in their congregation where they live, not a member here somewhere else, actually in another state. And the church there where that person went had three services on Sunday morning, three services. There was the early service, which was, as described to me, the traditional service. Singing, preaching, you know, like, like what we're doing here uh, this morning, the traditional service. And then a little later on, they had the progressive service. And at the progressive service, they had the praise team and the hand clapping and a lot of interaction and the women served the communion and uh, it was a, a sister who was making the announcements. And so they had the progressive service. Okay, fair enough. And then they had the third service and the person who was describing this to me was searching for words, you know, because they said traditional progressive and then they were searching for words for the third service and they said, and then we have the third service and it's, it's, it's well, anything goes. <laughs> That's how they describe the third service. Anything goes. Experimenting with new ideas. <clears throat> This member said that, well, this particular church was growing. So it didn't matter if we were changing things around. Maybe that was a good thing, but it ended up in a question mark. They didn't say it's a good thing. They said it's a good thing. <laughs> and I replied that when it comes to the church, God is more interested in faithful than big. More interested in faithful than big. If anyone thinks that God is not interested in orderly devotional services, if God is not interested in religious ritual, that God is not interested in symbolism and organized public worship, if they think it doesn't matter, anything goes, then they need to re-examine the Old Testament and the history of the Jews. Because anybody who ever says that to me tells me they have not read the Old Testament, not carefully anyways. From the beginning of time, man has been given religious practices to carry out in order to express his faith and his respect towards God. We don't use that word very often, faith towards God, but respect towards God. The patriarchs built altars and offered animal sacrifices as a way of adoration and making vows. They served as priests for their families and their tribes, all under the direction of God. And when the nation of Israel was formed, God instructed Moses, who taught the people how to build the place of worship, how to prepare the furnishings for the place of worship, how to select the, uh, uh, the, the, the special clothing for the priests, uh, how to select and train uh, and anoint the priests and those who would serve at worship. Um, there is explanation of the elaborate details of when and how and why and who and what should be done to worship God properly. Believe me, the Bible teaches that God is very interested in how we worship him. And consequently the nation was blessed or punished based on how meticulously they followed these instructions. And this system stayed in place not for a day or a year or a month, for 15 centuries. These instructions stayed in place. And then in the New Testament God through Jesus gave new instructions for public worship that maintained the attitude of reverence and faith, but changed the externals to reflect more accurately the new realities made possible by Jesus Christ and what He had done. For example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, Paul teaches us that we, we are the new temple. We don't have to go out and build a temple. We're the temple. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, John says that 
we are the priests. We don't have to go pick priests. We don't have to dress the priests. We're the priests. And in Galatians 3 verse 27, Paul tells us that Jesus is our clothing, the special clothing worn. Jesus is who we wear. We don't have to fabricate elaborate clothing for the priests. We wear Jesus, He's our clothing. And in Mark 16 and 16, we know that the priests are selected through the obedience to the gospel and not selected because they come from a particular tribe or they have special, you know, no, no physical defects and so on and so forth. Now the priests are selected through obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in Acts chapter 2 verses 42 to 45, we learn that the manner of worship now includes prayer and singing and teaching and giving and the Lord's Supper, all the things that we've done this morning. Instructions for these things are given in the New Testament, just as instructions for Old Testament style worship were given to Moses 1500 years before Jesus. Now, <clears throat> I'm saying all of this to emphasize the point that public worship has always been important to God. Not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament as well. He designed it, He commanded it, He explained it, He receives it, He will punish those who ignore it, He will change it or participate in it as He pleases. It will always be a part of a believer's life and activity. Because it is important and highly visible in the history of the Jews and prominent in the New Testament, we seem to think that it's the only thing that God wants from us. You know, the point I'm making is it's important, but it's not the only thing that's important. You know, we seem to think public worship is the only thing that God wants from us. Go to church, at least to have communion on a semi-regular basis, and I've given to God what He wants from me. After all, we're doing it right, and it's important to do it right. I'm not saying that we're all as callow as this, but sometimes it seems that Many people have a very one-dimensional spiritual life, and by one-dimensional I mean that their only contact with God is in public worship, and their only satisfaction in spiritual things is the satisfaction that comes from offering public worship on a regular basis. But you see, God desires more than this in His relationship with us. Despite the fact that it is important to Him, and it is important how we do it, He wants more from us. He desires more than the formal relationship that develops between a person and their Lord in organized worship. He desires the kind of relationship that two friends have. Isn't that interesting? The kind of relationship that is personal and felt and productive and important and intimate and satisfying he wants that with us, imagine. Now we know this is true because God has had this kind of relationship with other people in the past. Moses spoke with God face to face. David was called the friend of God. Jesus loved Lazarus, his friend, it says. And John rested his head on Jesus' breast, it says. And he was close friends with Mary and Martha. And Paul was often visited and comforted by the Lord when he was in a difficult situation. His friend comforted him. Different people who lived at different times but each had a unique and deeply personal relationship with God. I believe that they were able to experience this because they were able to get beyond the structure of organized worship and they learned what God truly desired. 
You see, public worship is like a formal relationship with God and like any relationship to become deeper and more intimate, you have to get to know the other person and what they enjoy. It's like the relationship you have with someone at work, a colleague at work, and it's, it's a professional relationship, and good morning, and you know, we cooperate with them, we trade reports, we go to meetings together, we build things together. You know, we have that, pro, uh, that professional relationship, but if we want that relationship to go deeper than that, what do we do? Well, we, we go to lunch with them, we invite them to our house, we introduce them to our wives or husbands and so on and so forth in order to deepen that relationship. The point I'm trying to make here is that it's the same thing with God. We have this public formal relationship with Him here, but He wants a deeper relationship. He wants more from us. Thankfully, we have inspired writings of those who often describe their feelings and the nature of their relationship with God. For example, and I would ask that you take your Bibles out if you have them, in Psalm chapter 50, and I'm going to read out of there, in Psalm chapter 50, verses 13 to 15, we are shown some of the things that God truly desires beyond the rituals of public worship. You see, we don't grow closer to God by eliminating or changing public worship. We grow closer to God by finding out what, in addition to this, He desires from us. I'm so saddened when I see churches destroy or, or, or change the, the worship that God has given to us and clearly described to us and their goal is to draw closer to Him somehow, as if adding a 20-piece band, as if shining colored lights, as if jumping up and down, as if changing around the, the notion of male spiritual leadership in the Lord's church, as if clapping and doing all, as if this is going to make you closer to God. It doesn't. It doesn't work that way. So let's read some of the things that God desires from us. Because if we give Him what He desires, we draw closer to Him and get the thing we really want from Him. And that's intimacy. So Psalm 50, in verse seven, uh, beginning in verse seven. He says, Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I do not reprove you for your sacrifices and your burnt offerings are continually before me. I shall take no young bull out of your house, nor male goats out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. Um, I know every bird of the mountains and everything that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all, of, and all it uh, contains. So in these verses, you know, God reminds the people that what the Jews were offering Him in public worship were simply things that God had already provided them. You know, their sacrifices are before Him and he doesn't reject them. He's not angry at them. He's not saying, I don't want your sacrifices. He receives their sacrifices, but he wants to remind them that they worship according to his instructions, and that's like a good thing. That they do everything according to his commands. This is also a good thing, and they should continue doing that, he says. However, they need to remember that he designed the worship style. He blesses it. He guides its meaning, he blesses them because of it, and it began with him and it ends with him. So yes, keep worshiping the way I've told you to worship me. That's a good thing. Remember, I'm the one that gave this to you. Not, you didn't invent it, I invented it, and I gave it to you. And then he says the animals they sacrifice, they're acceptable in quality and quantity, but he reminds them that all that they offer belongs to him in the first place. And he's not out stealing or browbeating them. All animals are his and he provides them to his people 
uh, for this very purpose. So in case they're getting puffed up with pride because of the beauty and the preciousness of their ceremonies or the value of their animal sacrifices, God reminds them that as far as public worship are concerned, they are simply offering Him what He has already given to them. You know, it's like a child who would become proud in front of his brothers and sisters for giving dad a Christmas gift that dad gave him the money to go buy for him. You remember that when you were a kid? My mom used to give me five dollars you know, a week or so before Christmas when I was little or whatever, and I would go out and buy her a Christmas present and wrap it up and, you know, with half a yard of scotch tape and I'd give it back to her. Oh, what a big surprise, it, you know? So he's saying, hey, don't, don't, don't get puffed up you know, for giving me you know, lots of sacrifices and so on and so forth. I gave you all of it. It all belongs to me to begin with. But in the, in the next verses, he tells them that if they really want to please him, let them give him something that is really theirs to give, something that they have that he really desires. So the first thing that he truly desires, that belongs to them, is true thanksgiving. In verse 13. He says, shall I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of male goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Something we have control over is sincerity. We control the sincerity part of the worship. Nothing builds better and stronger relationships between people than sincerity. And this is true with God as well. God is an intelligent, feeling being and He responds to sincerity. Sincerity in thanksgiving because of the nature of our relationship with God. He's the primary giver. We are on the receiving end. Our most repeated emotion is one of thanksgiving. And God wants us to be conscious and sincere in this thing. God, I sincerely thank you. I get it, Lord, I get it. It's all yours. You gave everything. I cannot take a breath. I can't blink. I can't do a thing. My heart beats with every beat. You have given me all those things and I am so, so, so thankful, God. What could I do without you? Who could I be without you? Where would I go without you? Again, he, he desires this not because he needs this, but because he knows what the benefits of, through, of true thanksgiving can bring to us. It's the best way of acknowledging his influence in our lives. It keeps us close to Him in a proper style of communication. God is God and the normative and most pleasant form of communication is that of praise and thanksgiving. Yeah, to your buddies that you play ball with or bowl with or hunt with or golf with, to your buddies, hey, you joke with each other, you rag on each other, you know, and so on and so forth. That's your buddies. God is not your buddy. <laughs> so we don't rag on God, we don't joke about God, we don't, you know, we don't bug God. You know, that's what we do with our buddies. We show our love to our buddies by you know, taking them down a notch or two, right? That's what we do. But not with God. With God, the normative conversation is thanksgiving and praise. That's the normative conversation. And it's also good for us emotionally because it helps us avoid neg negativism and depression. What's the first sin that Paul talks about in Romans that begins the, the, the tumbling downwards? They forgot to give thanks. They forgot in their primary relationship to be thankful. And that neglect moved them in a downward moral, spiritual, psychological 
spiral. God desires our sincere thanks because this is the purest and most joyful line of communication with Him while we are separated by this flesh and this world. It'll be different when we're in heaven, but for now the sinful flesh and the fallen world stand between us. And so thanksgiving and praise is the proper and normative conversation we have with God Almighty. Secondly, what He desires, He desires that we fulfill our promises to Him. In verse 14 He says, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. You know, God always fulfills His promises. It's our promises that get abandoned. It's our promises that get broken. Promises to our spouses to be faithful. Promises in society to do good work, to take responsibility, to uphold justice, to be a good citizen, to be a true friend. And not just the promises we make to God, it's any promise we make, we make before God as Christians. And He wants, He desires that we keep our promises, promises to our families to be there for them in times of difficulty. Promises, yes, also to God about being faithful to Christ and to the church. Keeping our promises demonstrates righteous living honesty, dependability, a person who can be counted on in this world of broken contracts and disposable relationships. Wanting to keep our promises is a hallmark of godly character and it says to God that in the quest for a deeper relationship with Him, we are ready to be like Him in a very important way. Yes, I want to be like God. You know, I, I, I don't want bad things to come out of my mouth. I don't want evil things to come out of me. I want to be like God. But I want to be like Him in this important way as well. I want to be a promise keeper. I want to be a man of my word. And when I know that this is what He desires from me in order to have a relationship, a deeper one with Him, I am motivated to be a man of my word. And then in this passage, certainly we could go on, but in this passage, in verse 15, one other thing He says that He desires from us, and that is that we trust Him. Verse 15, call upon me in the day of trouble, I shall rescue you and you will honor me, he says. God wants more than anything else that we trust Him. He wants this because this is our most precious gift to Him, our trust. I love the, the visual lesson that Marty gave, right, a couple of weeks back. He put the, you know, he took a plank, a, a, a plank, and he says, uh, yeah, I, I believe this plank. You know, he held it up like this. He says, I believe this plank here could, could hold me. I really do believe this plank could hold me. And he was holding it in his hand. But then he put it between two pews and all 300 pounds of, oh, I'm sorry, 200 pounds, <laughs> right? He put the plank between the two pews and then he got, up on the, he got up on the plank. And I know some of you were saying, oh, please let it break. You know, it YouTube moment, right? YouTube moment. But all kidding aside, when he got, didn't you get a, just a little catch in your throat when he kind of cl clambered above, on that plank? And he said, now this is trust. You're putting your money where your mouth is. This is trust. That's what God wants from us. Not just, you know, this, I believe in God, blah, blah, God, I'm a Christian, yakety, yakety, yak, you know. He doesn't want just that. He wants you to kind of put the plank between the two and he wants you to get aboard. He wants trust. It's the most precious thing because it is the most difficult thing to give since we naturally want to trust what we can see or feel and what we can count. 
in times of trouble, sin trouble, physical trouble, social trouble, economic trouble, emotional trouble. He wants us to trust Him and trust Him first, not last, not ourselves, not other things, not other people. Trust Him first. The entire exercise between God and the Jews in the Old Testament was to get the people to trust Him, not just in Him, you know, the idea of God, but in the very real, very present person of the Almighty God. We find out who our friends are when the going gets rough. The true friends will stick with us. And they'll stick with us through sickness and poverty, and yes, even when we do stupid, reckless, mean things. Our friends will stick with us. They might not like what we're doing, but they'll stick with us. Our friends may not like what we do, but they will always be our friends. Offering God our trust is to test our relationship with Him and find out how good it is, how good and sincere a friend He can be. To trust God for your life here on earth and your resurrection to eternal life is to offer Him an exclusive relationship with yourself. And you know what? You control that. He doesn't control that. He's created us in such a way where we are able to say to Him, Almighty God, we're able to say yes or no. Yes, I trust you. Or no, I don't trust you. In the end, this is what God really wants. When you've given Him this, you've given Him all you have and are able to give, and He will enter a deep and eternal relationship with you. In the final verse of Psalm 23, or verse 23, we see that God wants the same things from all of us. It says, he who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me, and to him who orders his way aright, I shall show the salvation of God. What does he want? Sincere thanksgiving. The keeping of our promises. Absolute trust. And he wants these things because he offers the very same thing to all of us. Salvation forgiveness of sins, resurrection from the dead, and eternal life with Him. So I ask this morning, how, how is your relationship with God? I know that our public worship is okay. We sang, we took the Lord's Supper, we've, we've had fellowship, we've read God's word. You know, our public fellowship, our public worship is good. But how is our personal relationship? Is it still you know, stiff and formal? Hello and goodbye, Sunday, Wednesday? Or is it warm and rich and satisfying like that of a best friend, of a confidant? If you want a relationship with God, it begins, of course, with faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, as the Son of God, repentance, immersion in water, and a faithful life. And if you want to renew your relationship with God because you have strained it through sin and neglect, then confess your sins and let us pray for your restoration. If it's just too formal, too far away, why not develop a stronger prayer and praise life and a greater effort at obeying Him and a new commitment that you will trust Him and only Him no matter what. If we can help you draw closer to God this morning, why not let us know by coming forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.